Okay, thank you everyone. My name is Stacy Cayley and I'm the Good Systems Network Relationship Manager. Thank you so much for joining us as we uh, convene our first speaker series event of the season. Good Systems is an interdisciplinary research grant challenge at UT Austin focused on defining, evaluating, and building ethical human AI systems for the benefit of society. And our speaker series brings together diverse perspectives on issues related to ethical AI. And today I'm happy to introduce you to our host, Dr. Greg Durrett. He's an assistant professor in the Department of Computer, Computer Science here at UT Austin. And he helps lead research for the Good Systems Project, designing responsible AI technologies to curb disinformation. And now Dr. Durrett, I'll turn it over to you to introduce our speaker. All right, yeah, thanks, Stacey. So we're really happy to have uh, Preslav Nakov joining us today. Um, so he is a professor at the Mohammed bin Zayed University of Artificial Intelligence, uh, and previously he was at QCRI. Uh, he received his PhD at UC Berkeley, and uh, he's been working in the area of, I guess, broadly semantics for a long time, um, including work in the early 2000s on uh, latent semantic analysis, uh, which was sort of one of the cool things of that time before we had large pre-trained models in BERT that were already sort of discovering representations uh, of text and things like that. Um, and so recently he's done a lot of work, uh, you know, very relevant to the space of misinformation and disinformation, um, including the Tanbi project, uh, looking at kind of news diets and a bunch of other uh, work on kind of formulating tasks and models for trying to tackle aspects of kind of fake news and uh, misinformation broadly, which, um, you know, I'll basically let him tell us about. Uh, he's won numerous awards and leads uh, a number of organizations within the ACL community. And I guess most recently I saw him at ACL 2022, where he was one of the program co-chairs, which is a massive undertaking for an AI conference in uh, this day and age. So without further ado, let me turn it over to him, Preslav. Uh, thank you so much, Greg, for the introduction, and thanks, uh, everybody, for the uh, invitation. So let me try to share my screen. And, uh, okay. You should see my slides now. Looks perfect, thanks. Yeah, okay. So, um, okay, let me start with the question, what is fake news? Um, I imagine that if you see something like that, okay, all oh, days the hidden agenda behind COVID-19 is this microchip that Bill Gates is going to insert into us and all that. I mean, if you've seen things like that, I guess that you would agree that this is a prototypical fake news. Uh, but what about this one? Okay, experts predict that COVID-19 vaccine could be ready as soon as a team of sled dogs travels you come with it. I mean, uh, and, and, and you see this coming from the onion, obviously this is something, um, you know, the onion is, is, is a, is a no kind of satirical website. So, I mean, the question is, is there a difference between this one and this one? So there's no clear definition of fake news. Uh, different dictionaries have different definitions and under, under most definitions, uh, under all definitions, this first one would be a fake news, but this uh, second one would be a fake news under some definitions, it would not be under some others. Uh, and actually, um, as you remember, probably uh, during the COVID-19, <coughs> pandemic, uh, certain uh, neuro uh, uh, social media platforms have taken efforts to uh, shut down websites that are spreading this information. And, and, and it has been like trying to uh, uh, limit the spread of this information online. And they would stop something like that, but they would not really stop something like this because this is considered satire and it's really kind of some free speech and so on and so forth. And what is the difference? Well, the second one doesn't really want us to believe in it. And it's, it's, it's kind of designed to make fun. Well, this one actually is supposed to kind of, we are supposed to believe that. And uh, there's a famous uh, uh, slide coming from, from uh, First Drive News that, that uh, defines the, the, the proper term. And the proper term, the, the problem with fake news is that it really misleads people to uh, focus on, on the factuality. So to many people, fake news sounds like false news. Um, and actually the most initial efforts have been focusing on fact-checking on, on, and, and on fake news detection. So um, <clears throat> uh, international organizations these days, like uh, the World Health Organization, United Nations, the European Union, NATO, and so on, are talking about a different term, disinformation. This is a term that is also adopted by fact-checkers and journalists, and it's something that has a very clear definition. It's something that is both false and intends to do harm. 
Okay, and uh, it is to be distinguished from mis misinformation, which is uh, just false, but there's no uh, not necessarily intention to do harm. And there's malinformation, which is just har harmful, and it can be true, can be false. Um, and um, so, my misinformation is if I kind of don't really remember certain certain information exactly correct and kind of I'm uh, approximate, uh, and and I don't really intend to do uh, to, to cause any harm. My information is, for example, when somebody uh, hacked the web server of uh, the mail server uh, of uh, Dr. Fauci or of Hillary Clinton, and then expose certain uh, real real uh, emails online. Right, this kind of real information used for malicious purposes. So this information is 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 in the intersection of those two things, and the vast majority of research has really focused on factuality and has has. Uh, um, um, ignore the intent to do harm, um, and um, uh, but, but things are changing. So if you think about it, the previous uh, U.S. information, uh, the previous U.S. presidential elections from 2016 brought us the term fake news, where the, the focus was really on factuality. But uh, the latest U.S. presidential elections, there was a lot of debate about uh, hate speech and harm and so on and so forth. And even uh, uh, more recently, with the eruption of the pandemic. Um, uh, actually, earlier than that, with the eruption of the pandemic, the World Health Organization defined the term infodemic, uh, which sounds like pandemic. And really, you can see that the term itself focuses on the harm. And this um, gradual move of researchers in the topic, in moving from factuality to the potential to do harm. And those are, to me, those are equally important components. It's important to look into both. Of course, the vast majority of, of the research was focused on, on, on factuality, uh, but then we're trying to to cover both aspects uh, today. Okay, so it, if you're talking about factuality, uh, well, the first thing that people started doing was fact-checking. So let, let's think about it. Is fact-checking the solution to this information? So according to the Duke Reporter Swap, there are about 300 uh, active uh, fact-checking initiatives worldwide, and there are about 100 inactive. Uh, and those are only the certified ones because uh, this the international fact checking network, this this uh, kind of certain process certification. And you might think, okay, that's actually a lot, right? But uh, uh, if you look into how much has been fact checked, things are not so rosy. So uh, this is from Claims KG, which is an uh, uh, initiative to parse different uh, fact check claims into a uh, knowledge graph. Uh, but kind of let's let's not really focus here on the knowledge graph. Let's focus on the how much has been fact checked. And you see that some other initiatives like Snoops and Politifact uh, uh, and FactCheck.org, which is not shown here, have fact checked you know uh, quite a few over ten thousand. I mean, I think Politifact now has over twenty thousand fact checked, right? But the others just have a few hundred. And why is that? Well, because the speed of, of fact checking is actually not that great. We have talked to different fact check organizations. So, for example. Two weeks ago, uh, I was at CLEF and we had their keynote speaker, uh, uh, the, the um, president of the major fact checking organizations in, in uh, Italy, uh, Pagina Politica and Facta. And for one of them, it turns out that the speed of fact checking is one claim per day, for the other one is two claims per day, right? You see that it's not that much. I mean, full fact is the leading one in UK and just has a few hundred. Um, so, what can we do? Well, this, this, again, the vast majority of research has been focusing on, okay, can we automate the entire process, right? So here's a claim if you want actually to, to fact check whether this is true or not. Um, and and uh, But we can also look into something else. We can, we can look into what fact checkers want and how can we make their work more productive if we believe in their efforts. Um, and I can make here parallel with a different kind of technology, uh, uh, translation technology. So, um, Again, kind of, we are probably familiar with the fully automatic machine translation, like Google Translate, Microsoft Bing Translate, and so on and so forth. But there's another technology, translation memories, which actually makes human translators twice as effective and, and more accurate. So, um, and 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 you know, the question is, can we do something similar to facilitate the the work of fact checkers? And the question is, what do they want? Again, so we I, we have been running the CLEF fact check the check that up for five years now, and we are going to have another sixth year iteration next year. And as part of that, we had a round table back in uh, 2020, where we had uh, representatives of different fact check organizations. So we had somebody from Fulfact, 
uh, David Corney. We had uh, somebody from, uh, which is the leading one in UK. We had somebody from Neutral, the leading one in Spain. We had some, somebody from Fatabiano, the leading one in, in Jordan, in the Arab world. And we asked them, what do you guys want? And what kind of systems do you need to facilitate your work? And they have borrowed this website, uh, this slide from, from uh, uh, David. And um, so you see that the first thing that they need is to know whether something was previously fact-checked or not. Uh, sorry, this is the second one. The first one is actually to, to tell them what claims are interesting to fact check in the first place. Okay, the second one is whether something was fact checked before. And the third one is actually to give them evidence uh, that is going to facilitate their work. And actually, if you want to learn about technology, it actually is really focusing on checking fact checkers. We have written uh, a survey last year. So, okay. And I have mentioned the check the twap. And I'm proud that we have been really uh, focusing on all four steps of the typical fact verification uh, pipeline. So in the first step is actually to detect whether something is worth fact checking and it can be worth fact checking for different reasons, maybe because it's harmful and so on and so forth. Um, and then detecting whether it was previously fact checked by comparing to claims in some, uh, some database, supporting evidence retrieval and actual fact checking. And actually more recently we have been focusing on those two tasks, which are exactly the tasks that fact checkers want. And we have been looking into political debates and speeches and also into tweets. And we have been covering different kinds of languages like Arabic, Bulgarian, German, English, Spanish, uh, uh, Dutch, and Turkish. And, and, and here Arabic and English, and we are adding uh, further languages. And we also had uh, fake news detection, uh, uh, which is different. So kind of fake news is about factuality of, of, of a news article, and uh, fact checking is about detecting, predicting the factuality of a claim. So, okay, let's move into, into the first task, right? What is worth fact checking in the first place in political debates? Okay, imagine a political debate, um, and it just uh, 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 finished, and you know that the typical speed of checking a claim, maybe it's like one claim per day or two, you know, for a fact checking organization. Um, and um, suppose that you kind of, you have now uh, accumulated, uh, you have uh, gathered together several fact checkers and you're ready to do more, maybe like 20, 10 or 20 or 30, you know, in a day, because it's urgent and you want to do it. But the thing is that the debate has about 1,300 sentences uh, uh, on average. Uh, which one would you fact check first? Right. I mean, you need to prioritize because uh, studies have found that about 20% of the claims in the debate are actually interesting to fact check. Right. And if you do manual annotation, but uh, somehow you need to really, really prioritize. Okay. So you, you can imagine a system that is your rank list and, 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 and you can kind of uh, uh, can look into the output of the system. So the question is, what kind of data can you train such a system? Um, and uh, our answer is, okay, let's actually see, look into what fact checkers actually have fact checked. So you can look into historical political debate speeches uh, uh, and so on and so forth. And often they are uh, annotated by fact checkers. For, so for example, here is the US presidential debate from 2016. And you see that PolitiFact has decided that they are going to fact check this part of the claim and they have a link and saying, okay, this is mostly false. And there's an article which explains why it's mostly false. So for this specific task, we are not interested in, in whether it's true or false or in this article, we are just interested uh, to know that out of the 1,300 sentences, uh, they have decided to select part of this specific sentence and have decided not to select uh, parts of other sentences. So basically here we have like positive examples. You are not sure about the negative ones, but and if you can imagine that you want to build a system that puts as high as possible claims that uh, fact-checking organizations uh, have, have uh, decided to fact-check and, and others kind of somewhere lower in, in the ranking. And actually different faction organizations have been doing this. So you can do even multitask learning. You can uh, try to learn from, from CNN, you know, from Check Dead, uh, sorry, from PolitiFact, from, from uh, you know, ABC, New York Times, and so on and so forth, right? And you can imagine multitask learning because it turns out that out of those nine faction organizations that we have looked into, only one claim was checked by all nine, okay? So there's also kind of a little bit of subjectivity or, or, or a little bit of uh, priority and so on and so forth. Collectively, you know, about a thousand claims have been, have, have been checked, right? But, but kind of only one by, by all of them, right? Uh, um, uh, this is in, in, in several debates. And, and what kind of things you can look at? Well, you can look into the language, you can look into the style, you can look into the context. You can look into whether they are numerical entities uh, and all, all kinds of embeddings. You can see whether the claims are similar in content uh, or in structure to previously fact-checked claims. 
Um, you can look whether the, the name of the opponent is being mentioned, and you can also kind of look into the reaction. So, for example, if uh, Hillary Clinton says, okay, Donald Trump believes that the climate change is a hoax invented by the Chinese, and he says, I didn't say that. Okay, now they are arguing about it, and you, you might want actually to go and, and, and see who of them is right. And, and uh, of course, kind of multitask learning also helps. And the context also helps. Kind of, we had some uh, some work on that. One shows that the importance of the context in the other one showing the importance of multitask learning. Mm -hmm. And we had a system for that. Actually, I think that this specific system is down, but we have another one that kind of has this functionality. And you can even kind of say, I want to mimic the, the style of one specific source, or I want to do this in English, or uh, I want to do this in Arabic, and so on and so forth. The next thing is, uh, okay, what is worth fact-checking in tweets? Uh, see, uh, uh, many uh, uh, journalists are following Twitter accounts of celebrities and politicians and are looking for, for uh, interesting claims to fact check. And for example, he's Eric Trump and he tweets all kinds of things, right? And, and, and most of them are not really interesting to fact check, right? So, um, um, and they, they, they see many of them, there's not even a claim. But one day he tweets this. Okay, because the media are not going to report this. He's a check that, you know, Donald Trump is actually donating his salary to uh, fight the coronavirus. And I guess that, that you would agree with me that this is something that is potentially worth fact checking, right? It's, it's, it's an interesting claim. And by the way, if you are wondering, it's true. He was donating his salary. This, this specific claim was actually fact checked by fact checkers and it is actually true. Okay, so um, what makes a tweet for a check worthy? So there was no real definition. We looked into about 20 different criteria and eventually reduced them to uh, five. So one of them is kind of uh, implicit. Um, we have been asking people, uh, human annotators, to, to answer to those five questions in this order. The first one, does it contain a verifiable factual claim? So if there's no verifiable factual claim, there's nothing to fact check. Then, uh, you know, if you look into the definition of disinformation, there are two components. One should be false. So you have a question where, which asks whether it's likely to be false. And then two, it should be harmful. So we have a question that asks whether it's likely to be harmful, whether it looks harmful. Right. And three, we have also that it should be of general public interest. And we have one implicit one that this tweet, uh, you know, should have been seen or should have the potential to be seen by, you know, a large number of people. And then, and then we didn't really tell people that those are criteria. We just asked them, the notators, to annotate in this order. And finally, we asked them whether this is worth fact checking. Um, and, and, you know, it can meet all these criteria, but it might still not be worth fact checking because, for example, it might be too trivial to check. Right. If I say the 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 gross domestic domestic product of the U.S. grew during the pandemic by twenty percent, this is something that you can re very easily kind of you know go and fact check, and this doesn't really deserve the the, the attention of of, of of you know human fact checkers. Okay, and um, actually it turns out that decomposing the task in this way, uh, uh, you know, and doing uh, multitask learning, let's say okay, this is a given because this is a showstopper. If there's no verifiable factual claim, there's nothing to, to be done here, right? Uh, but if you, if you do multitask learning, trying to predict whether the claim is false, whether it's likely to be harmful, and whether it's of public interest, together with whether it's worth fact checking, you see a sizable, quite sizable improvement, you know, regardless of whether you use BERT or Roberta, right, to, to, to make this, this prediction. And, and, uh, uh, and, and, and similar kind of things, you know, for the other questions. So basically by decomposing the, question, the, the, the problem into different uh, aspects that are relevant, you can actually uh, achieve improvements. And uh, we had this task as, as part of the Check the Lab, which, uh, uh, which just presented uh, in September. And, and, and here's the data, data that we have. So we have Arabic, Bulgarian, English, Dutch, Spanish, and Turkish. And I want to point out that for Spanish, we have actually data not annotated manually by us uh, and, and, and by our collaborators, but actually annotated by the Neutral, which is the leading Spanish uh, uh, fact-checking organization uh, in Spain uh, as part of their process. So kind of this, is, this is real data, right, coming exactly from, from, from fact-checkers. Um, so let me now look into the next task, which is detecting previously fact-checked claims. Um, one problem with fact-checking is that people don't really trust uh, uh, the, the automatic methods and partly because they don't understand how they work, uh, because they cannot really get uh, an explanation, but people actually trust human fact-checkers. So uh, again, uh, um, some uh, two, three weeks ago, I was in it, we were in Italy in this uh, uh, CLEF, uh, um, um, you know, 
um, uh, shared task and 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 uh, uh, so and 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 uh, um, Giovanni Zani, the the leader of uh, uh, Politica and and, and Facta, was telling us that they get actually three times higher traffic to their website. Uh, uh, during the election campaign, which means that actually people go there and, and are interested to see whether human fact checkers, what human fact checkers have fact checked, right? So actually people do believe this is important. So, um, but the, the thing is that people keep repeating the same claims and you might want to do out to detect whether a claim was fact checked for, for different reasons. So one is you want to save time, okay? So if fact checking a claim takes a day or two, sometimes a week, uh, then you don't really want to fact check something that was fact checked before. This is number one. Uh, number two, um, you uh, certain fact checking organizations like uh, like uh, Full Fact, for example, in UK, after they fact check a claim, they actually actively look to see whether politicians keep repeating the same claim that that they have found is not really true. And if they find out that they keep repeating it, they actually approach them and say, look, we have a fact check this claim, we know it's not true, uh, and here's the article, and you know, are we missing something? Do you want to make a statement? Because kind of you keep repeating it. So actually they want to have a real impact. Um, and um, of course, you might want to do fact uh, detecting previously fact check claim as, as a way to do fact checking. So, for example, many claims about COVID 19 can be previously fact checked by uh, World Health Organization or other fact checking organizations, but they kept being repeated, right? And actually, one easy way to do fact checking, actually, it's not so trivial to do the comparison, is actually by comparing to previously fact checked claims. And uh, there's actually yet another reason, and, and you can imagine the system, right? So. If, if you have a claim and you have a database, you basically want to rank it so that the, the most similar claim to this one, you know, comes on the top. And, and uh, you can, uh, you know, another reason why you might want to do this is that uh, this can be something that can assist uh, the moderator of a political debate or can assist the journalist at the time of an interview, right? Um, and, and you can actually kind of put the politician on the spot in real time. So here's the thing. Suppose that I have a, a, a device, you know, running a system running on my phone or, um, and uh, on a smartphone and, and tells me, okay, uh, so um, uh, this 97% chance that the person is right now. I mean, can I actually say, you know, because fact checking happened in real time. Can I uh, put the position on the spot and say, uh, okay, so I have here an AI that tells me that uh, you are, uh, you know, not telling the truth. Can you elaborate on that? I mean, you cannot do that, right? And why is this? Because you don't know how the system works. You, you don't trust it. But if it tells you, look, I mean, he just said something, you know, or she, that uh, was previously fact-checked and we know it's not true, and here's what was said, and, and here is, uh, 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 you know, the, the fact-check, and, and, and here's the claim, and, and this is fact-checked by a reliable source, then actually because we trust the fact-checkers, you can follow up on the spot in real time and say, wait, wait, that's not true. Right? Okay, the disclaimer was fact checked and, 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 and you know, can you now elaborate? It is something that actually can revolutionize uh, journalism and political debates. And uh, there, 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 there are some initial attempts at systems like that. So it is, it is an important problem by, by, for a number of, of, of tasks. And we can start working on this, uh, you know, a couple of years ago. Um, and this is not a real, a, a trivial problem. So for example, uh, uh, one one problem is that you actually need to uh, model the context. Excuse me, one second. Okay, so one one problem is that you actually need to model the context. So, for example, here, see this claim. I waited until it had actually been negotiated because I didn't want to give the benefit of the doubt to the administration. So, if you read this claim, it's not even clear what this is about, right? I mean, you really need to understand. It's not clear what these pronouns refer to. You don't know who it is and so on and so forth. You really need, need to, to understand the context. And then you, you can actually you know, uh, understand what the claim is. And, and a similar situation is on the target side where we have actually the, the article. And if you want to, to do a matching between this claim and, and the fact-checking article, actually the, the matching should not be done just at the, at the title level. It actually works better if you consider the, the entire text of the article and so on and so forth. Um, um, and, and you might want to have some, some kind of reasoning. Uh, I don't want to go into the detail here, but it's actually a, com a complex task, right? That might require reference resolution, uh, kind of uh, uh, context modeling and so on and so forth. Okay. Um, now, um, we probably uh, understand that 
even if we make the human fat checkers more productive, maybe two times, twice, three times, um, that's not a, 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 a solution to the, the disinformation. So um, um, then, then, then probably kind of auto, fully automatic fact checking might, 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 might help. And this is actually something that the vast majority of the, of the research was focusing exactly on this task, right? Can we fully automate the process? Um, and there are different ways that you can do that. So, for example, this is a, a, a work that we had. This was uh, uh, the best paper award at SICOM 2020 um, on, on, on fully automatic fact checking. It actually, uh, I'm showing it here because it, it has different components that are typical components uh, of, of, of different solutions to the problem. So basically, we have a claim. And what, what you're looking at is how it evolves over time, how people react to it, whether they agree or disagree. You know, you probably kind of have some model, some, some, some trust on the people based on the connections between them. Um, then you see whether the claim puts uh, kind of the tweets that comment, put a link to an article and you might want to decide whether this article is fake news or not. And you might also look into which source publishes it and whether it's a reliable source or not. And you might want to have also to model the, the relationships kind of the links between those sources because the, the, the fact is that you only know for a small number of articles whether they fake news or not. And you only know for a small number of websites whether they are reliable or not, right? And kind of, but but by reasoning over this heterogeneous graph, uh, looking into the, the links between different uh, uh, sources, between different people, agreement, disagreement, and so on and so forth, you can actually uh, uh, you know come up with 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 uh, some uh, decision whether this claim is likely to be true or likely to be false. Um, and one thing that I want to point out here is that uh, it's very important. So this work was done on the fake news net. Fake news net is a famous uh, data set that, that uh, uh, tracks the, uh, it's a collection of, of uh, what happens in, in, in uh, um, social media with claims that originate, that have been fact checked, but pretty fucking gossip cap. And this is the size. So we actually have created a larger data set recently and we have, we have publication earlier this year uh, uh, which uh, the, 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 the important thing is actually it's multilingual. So we have taken the uh, data set, the data that was shared actually by Facebook that contains 36 million URLs that were uh, shared on Facebook at least 100 times uh, uh, during this time period from J January 2017 to July 2019. And uh, over 10,000 of those have been manually fact-checked by third-party uh, uh, fact-checkers and we have the labels of that. And the interesting thing is that we actually have data in different languages. So you see a lot of, uh, you know, not just English, but a lot of Italian, Spanish, French, German, Portuguese, and so on and so forth. So um, and multilinguality is very important because uh, many claims, let's say about COVID-19 are made in, um, uh, in different languages. And actually, um, so uh, I guess about two months ago or so, or a month and a half ago, I was reading New York Times, uh, about an interesting thing that, uh, you know, certain uh, uh, people that want to spread this information uh, and don't want to be tracked, what they do is actually they go and they put it in some, in Latin America in Spanish. And then from there it goes in the Spanish speaking population in the US and also in Spain and from, and, and from there it goes everywhere. So actually kind of going multilingual is important. But still, uh, even with fully automatic fact checking, can we fact check every single claim in the world? Okay. Um, and uh, this, this is a very interesting uh, study back uh, from 2018 uh, that, that has shown published in science that shows that uh, uh, false information goes much further and spreads much faster than real news. Um, and there's another one that is kind of much less famous, but I like it, uh, uh, kind of, I, I find it very interesting. It shows that 50% of the lifetime spread of some very viral uh, fake news on Twitter happens in the first 10 minutes, which means that if it's going to eventually reach, let's say 70 million people, the first 35 million, are uh, reached in the first 10 minutes, which means that you really, really need to act fast. If you think about it, you know, in, in 10 minutes, there's probably not going to be articles about it. And those reactions kind of, it takes time to accumulate. And, 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 and so it's, it's, you really kind of need to do, to do something very fast. And um, another thing that can happen, that happens, I mean, uh, uh, is that uh, fake news generation can these days can be fully automated, right? So I have done uh, an experiment here Right, I mean, here's this article, the coronavirus was created in a secret research laboratory in Austin, Texas. So I just wrote this and the rest was written by uh, GPT-2 and they are kind of even better models these days. 
and the person on the right, the gentleman on the left, sorry, uh, does not exist. So it's coming from this person does not exist, which is a, a GAN generation website. Again, they, they are better text generators and they are better image generations generators. So it's really cheap. You, I can generate this a lot. And, and it's scary. Look, it even generated this, our standards, Thomson, Reuters, Trust principles, and so on and so forth. This is, this is also generated by the thing. And think about it. I mean, I have, by the way, I have tweeted this, right? And I have immediate, immediately deleted it. But I already kind of, you know, contacted by a couple of friends. Oh, your, your Twitter account got hacked, you know, can you check, you know, and stuff like that. But the point is that, see, if I tweet this, right, I mean, people don't really read, you know, it can actually be reshared and, 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 and uh, uh, yeah. So basically, I can, I can really do this, this at scale and very fast. So what can you do? Well, one thing that you can do is actually you can look into the source. So think about it. We have uh, several definitions of the task, okay? We have kind of auxiliary tasks where check wordiness, where it was fact-checked before, but the core tasks are uh, fact-checking a claim and fact-checking an article, right? But here I'm talking about a different task, which is fact-checking the factuality of a source. Um, and uh, so the point is that if you think of fake news, if you just put a claim, right, like this, and there's no URL to an article, people start questioning it very fast. And uh, they kind of start checking and they don't find any other information. They say, okay, you know, this is kind of baseless claim, right? So you actually need to put an article somewhere. Uh, but if you do, uh, then uh, the problem is that you are not really going to, uh, to create a new, you need to create an entire website just for one claim, just for an article. It's a lot of work. And if you want to spread this information again, you're going to reuse probably the same website, right? And uh, um, we can actually notice that and we can keep lists of such unreliable websites. And actually many fact checking organizations do that. This, uh, uh, you know, NewsGuard has that, PolitiFact has that, this uh, media bias fact check and so on and so forth. And I want to say, to speculate that you can detect the fake news before it was even written, because think about it. You come up with a claim, you know, maybe you use automatic generator, maybe you write it yourself, right? And then you put it somewhere. Um, well, uh, it's not going to be believed. It's going to be kind of, you know, going to disappear very fast. And people are going to report it very fast if there's no article about it. But this article has to sit on a website, right? And uh, chances are that this website can be in our list. Okay. So we can very quickly, and it's actually what, what journalists do, right? They ask, are there two or three independent sources that, that confirm that this is, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know that, that, that are supporting this claim? And we can actually quickly discover that this is not the case and uh, um, uh, different measures can be taken about it. So um, we have been working with different data sets. One of them is data from media bias fact check. So media bias fact check uh, has two aspects. So for example, for, for, for example, for New York Times, it's going to tell you it's a trial of reporting. Uh, it's going to tell you also um, the, the bias, right? So and the bias is on a seven point scale from extreme left to extreme right. And, and, and the virtuality is also, you know, on multiple kind of uh, granularity scale. Um, and uh, you can, once you redefine the task at this level, you can actually solve it in, in, in different ways. And uh, it's actually an easier task because you can use a lot, a lot of additional information. So you can look into articles, and you can go and you don't need to make a decision based on one article. one article. You can actually go and you can collect a few hundred, a few thousand articles from this website. And this is actually the most important uh, information source. But you can also look into their Twitter profile, right? I mean, about the articles, what can you look at? Well, you can look, is there a connection between the title and, and the body of the text? Um, is there a lot of repetition? Uh, um, you know, how complex is the language? How long is it? Because see, it's not easy to, to write fake news. You have to make things up. So you either become repetitive or you're short and, and, and this kind of things in the style, uh, you're probably also kind of uh, evoking a lot of emotions and so on and so forth. Um, you can see how they self-describe in their social media profiles. Uh, and if they have a YouTube channel, for example, what we are doing, we're looking into analyzing the, the sound of the, of the YouTube channels, we're looking into not only what they say, but how they say, it. is there a lot of emotion in the, in, in, in the, in the sound? And then you can see who is following them and how they self-describe their bi biographies and how they react to what is being published. You can look into what is there about them written about them in Wikipedia. And we are looking into a lot of other things, like who is hosting them, what kind of security certificate they use, what kind of you know web tracker they use, because those guys don't really want to be tracked, for example, for by Google Analytics, right? They want something else. Um, and you can look into what kind of images they, they contain. You can look into audience overlap. 
So, uh, and you can put all these things together. So more recently, we have moving into all this overlap. So uh, the idea is that, so for example, Alexa rank, which by the way, now is, uh, you know, not functional anymore, but we did this research when it was. So if you look into Reuters, the most similar websites, Bloomberg has 40% audience overlap with Reuters, okay? And CNBC, 38% uh, and so on and so forth. So basically the idea is that, uh, and, and in, if you look into some, you know, famous fake news website, you see, you know, few wars, you know, similar to Breitbart and, and news wars and so on. So basically the, the idea is that, you know, maybe websites that share audience uh, have, uh, you know, related factuality or, 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 or actually bias, bias is also important. And, and you can imagine, so for example, uh, you know, um, we have crawled, for example, 200 different websites and we have collected the information about them and, and, and overlap. And we have uh, reliable labels, let's say for about a thousand of them. And then we kind of use graph neural networks to try to, using also other information, like what the what is the, in the text, and the kind of try to propagate in the rest of the graph and to label uh, the other media with uh, reliability labels. And um, so one thing that, that I want to mention here is that there's a connection between factuality and bias. There's the media bias chart that shows you uh, that, for example, the most reliable sources like Reuters, France Press, Associated Press, Bloomberg are the least biased ones. And the extreme left and the extreme right are, are kind of those that are not really, you know, so factual. So, and, and you can, uh, you can imagine that it actually makes sense to do multitask learning, right? That tries to jointly predict virtuality and bias because those are related tasks. Uh, you see certain kind of correlation here, right? And we have actually done this. And in addition, if you pay attention here, uh, this is not just a classification, this is an ordinal classification task, right? Kind of, you know, you can think of, of uh, I mean, it's called also ordinal regression, but it's really kind of a classification on an ordinal scale. So basically you want uh, a class, the classifier, you know, also in your evaluation measure uh, to take into account that confusing extreme left with left is a small error, confusing extreme left with right is, is a much larger error, right? Kind of you want something, virtually speaking, proportional to the number of classes you know, how far away you are from, from the correct class. And the same for virtuality. So basically, um, uh, from a machine learning perspective, the task of uh, multitask ordinal regression, uh, which is actually a classification task, let's say multitask ordinal classification, if you want, is not well studied. So we have actually uh, worked work on that. Um, and trying to jointly predict virtuality and bias on different point scales and also centrality and hyperpartisanship. And all this can be derived from the uh, uh, bias scores. And of course, when you do this, you, you get certain performance gains on both tasks. Um, I have promised to you that I'm going to touch something a little bit on the on the harm, but uh, um, you know, one thing that, that goes a little bit in that direction partially is propaganda. So what is propaganda? Propaganda is a communication tool that is deliberately designed to influence the opinions and the actions of people uh, and has a predetermined goal. And now if you pay attention, um, so propaganda is uh, really uh, somehow orthogonal to uh, fake news. Okay, so sorry to disinformation, because um, uh, the disinformation had two components, right? It should be false and should intend to do harm. Propaganda also has two components. I try to influence you, your opinion, they have a goal, you know, to influence your thinking or, or, or your actions. Uh, now, if you pay attention, propaganda is not true, it's not false, it's not part of the definition. It is not good, it's not bad, it's also not part of the definition. So, I mean, propaganda can be done with true uh, and, 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 and can actually kind of be done with good, good, good intentions. So, um, uh, for example, uh, you know, uh, a government might want to uh, convince their population to get vaccinated against uh, a bad disease or, or uh, I don't know, Greta Thunberg might want to scare us into uh, doing something to protect the environment. So kind of, you know, you can, you can argue that, you know, in, in, and, 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 and kind of, again, propaganda has a bad reputation, but really the origin of the term is uh, originally meant uh, the spread of the Catholic faith in the new world by Spanish and Portuguese. And it was uh, considered a hugely positive uh, development at the time. Now it has a bad reputation. So we can think of not only propaganda, maybe similar kind of things are related to um, advertisement or persuasion or mass communication. 
Um, and there has been a lot of work on propaganda detection. We have been also looking into that, into detecting whether an article is propagandistic or not. Um, and and uh, we have some, some interesting work on that. But um, at some point, we got interested in something else. Okay, So I mean, as I told you, the propaganda is really orthogonal. Uh, we uh, started looking into the specific techniques that, that are used to convince us. Okay. And if you look into the literature, there are different inventories, but basically they are partitioning the same space in different ways. So in certain inventories, there are 70 relations. In classic, some classical work, there are six. Uh, sorry, propaganda techniques, or if you want uh, uh, advertisement techniques, or if you want persuasion techniques, kind of don't pay that much attention to the term propaganda. It's, it's really about the same thing. You know, somebody tries to convince us of something. And there are two times. So uh, half of them, we are working with initially with 18, then 20, then 22. Um, and half of them are emotional. So things like appeal to fear, to emotions, name calling, and so on and so forth. And the other half are logical fallacies, things that don't make things uh, logically. Uh, so for example, I don't know, bandwagon or uh, a, a strongman fallacy or, or uh, fuck waving. And, and, sorry, fuck waving is, is, is on the emotional side. Black and white fallacy, dictatorship and stuff like that. Um, and we have created a data set for that, and we have built a system that actually, you know, given a text, it tries to detect the spans of those propaganda techniques in text. And here I have, uh, I'm showing you the output of the system. Maybe at the end of this time, I can actually show you some, some of those things in action because we have plenty of tools. Um, um, and uh, so here, for example, you see we will pursue any aggressor, this appeal to fear. You have brutality and bloodshed, this is worded language. Here you have Congress who will do our job to uphold the Constitution, defend our national security, and protect the American pe people. So this is flag waving. This is appeal to patriotic feelings, and those are ways that we are, you know, persuaded into into something. Um, and by the way, this was a best demo award, uh, honorable mention in uh, 2022 at ACL. Um, and the way that we do this, so kind of one model is that uh, we have a multi-granularity network that. Um, kind of tries to do multitask learning on the one hand to predict whether the sentence is propagandistic or not, and on the other hand to predict for each token where it's part of propaganda technique. And there's certain kind of interaction between these uh, through a special gate. Um, and we had tasks on this uh, uh, on English. We had actually now a shared task on this in tweets for Arabic. Um, and uh, uh, as of present, we are working together with the European Commission on a new task, uh, it's in about 2023, uh, where we are adding additional languages. So we are adding uh, uh, Russian, Polish, uh, um, Italian, French, and German, right? In addition to, to English that we already have. And we have a little bit of data for Arabic. And we have been working on this also in uh, um, um, for memes in a multimodal aspect. And there we have some uh, data also in Bulgarian and in Macedonia. So one connection, still there's a connection between uh, uh, fake news and, and um, um, uh, propaganda. And uh, so in particular, uh, when it comes to fake news, we probably have to notice that we don't really have that many examples, right? Maybe we have 10,000, maybe we have a few thousand, right? And But really uh, these days, uh, large scale transformers work, uh, work much better if you have large data sets. And actually one thing that people have done is they have been uh, writing uh, fake news generators and they have been like trying to train systems on their output to predict whether something was machine generated or not. Okay, knowing whether something is machine generated or not is an interesting and important task on its own right, because people do this and actually my tweet probably could have been detected because it's generated by one of those transformers. Um, but, uh, and, and we work with that, but actually, I mean, there are two problems with this. First of all, Pretty much, you know, there's, there are a lot of inaccuracies, but the other thing that we notice is that there's no propaganda, okay, um, uh, that much in, in, in this machine generated text. So we ex experimented with, this is work in progress, with injecting some propaganda techniques into the text. And in particular, we have two things. So one of them is uh, injecting coded language, and uh, this is part of the, as part of the, the end to end generation, of course. Um, not as a post-processing. And, and, and we have also um, uh, appeal to authority, which is a propaganda technique. So for example, we have something happening at the Square in Cairo, and we automatically identify from Wikipedia that you know a person that might be an authority, he is the Egypt's president. And we 
kind of invent a code by him, okay, and, and, and to inject it there. Turns out that this convinces people more, and moreover, if you train a system to detect human written fake news from human written real news, uh, it actually works better on, on this kind of uh, uh, machine generated uh, uh, propaganda augmented uh, fake news detection. Um, one other thing uh, that, that is interesting is that uh, um, there, there are different, uh, 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 I mean, so far I have been talking about analyzing the content, but this another orthogonal line of research that is actually uh, analyzing the network spread. Uh, and and uh, so the, the, there's a lot of work on trying to, to find coordinated users that are involved in, in certain campaign. Um, and uh, um, we kind of joined forces with a team from Italy that has been doing a lot of research on that and kind of detecting coordination. And uh, we have been working on the textual side to look into the propaganda. It was interesting to see the, the correlation between coordination and propaganda, um, uh, which have been typically studied separately. And we have done some, some interesting work on the UK elections. Um, and uh, so now coordination uh, is, is something that you can measure to a degree. So there's kind of some super coordinated core. And then at, at a lower degree of coordination, there's a little bit uh, larger group around the core. And there's, there's, there's basically a continuum, right? And for different coordination levels. And you can see the here horizontally. And here's the degree of propaganda. Um, and there are different communities uh, that we have you know, st studying in social media. And you expect that as coordination grows, the propaganda also grows because those are kind of more vocal people. But we actually found two communities in which one for which it doesn't matter and for the other one, propaganda actually goes down with more coordination. And it was an interesting finding. I mean, I don't want to go in detail, but actually this was the best paper award at website uh, this year. Okay, so uh, I'm um, kind of... Uh, Cautious of the time, so now we move into multimodality. So multimodality is important. So suppose that you know you have a, a, a meme, and I have now removed the the, the text of the, the image of the meme. I just show you the, the the you know the the content, right? And what kind of propaganda techniques can you find here? Well, we have hate, which is an emotional word. We have word language, and you have somebody is being called a terrorist. This is what you can see, right? But if I actually show you the the you know the the meme. And you have, you know, you kind of see other things. You see uh, uh, smears towards Ilhan Omar, which is a, a, you know, American politician. And then you have uh, a logical fallacy, which we also kind of try to detect, which is reductio ad Hitlerum. Basically, it says that if a bad person makes certain choice, this choice is bad. Okay, which means that okay, if bad people hate Trump, hating him is is a bad thing, right? So kind of this is kind of broken logic, um, and. Uh, um, of course, you uh, and we have like moving also into harmfulness, right? And moving a little bit away from punctuality, looking into a meme, try to detect whether it's harmful or not, and what is its target. It can be harmful for different reasons, maybe because it's fake news, maybe because it's hate speech, um, and maybe because it harmfully attacks somebody. Um, and we are also interested in the target of the attack is an individual organization, community, or society in general. Um, and we have some data set and, and, and some, some uh, you know, models for that. And then we moved into something else. So here the task is, if I give you a meme, okay, and I give you the, the text of the meme, and I also give you the entities there, which you can detect with name tent recognition or with the vision API of Google. Uh, um, so here's the list of the entities. You need to say which of those are harmfully attacked, okay? So here, for example, Bill Clinton, Hillary Clinton, Democrats are attacked, while White House and Donald Trump are not, okay? And then kind of moving forward, um, we have actually focused on a different task, trying to understand the perspective. Who is the hero, the view, and the victim in the meme? So, um, um, you know, um, and, and, you know, I can, I can talk about, I don't know, let's say I can talk about uh, the situation in Ukraine, about Ukraine in different perspectives, right? As a victim of, a, of an invasion or as a hero, right? And, and, and I, can, I can talk about, you know, certain entities as, as the villain uh, and so on and so forth. And so here the task is if I give you the, 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 uh, again, the, the meme, and they give you the, the text of the meme and the list of the target entities you need to tell me for each of them, not just, you know, where they are target harmfully attacked, but also who is the hero, the view, and the victim. Um, we have a data set and we have to share tasks about that. Um, and of course, explanation is very important. So more recently, we have been looking into that. Um, so here the task is, okay, suppose that you have a meme, I give you the text of the meme, I give you the image of the meme, and I tell you, okay, this is about the Democratic Party, and we know that the role is a victim, 
And you need to generate an explanation why it's the victim. And we generate something like the Democratic Party is portrayed as being falsely accused of a hoax, a stranger hoax. And, and, and this is what humans would, would write you know, about this. Um, and finally, uh, you know, looking into the, 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 info, the, 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 the pandemic, right? So uh, the World Health Organization in, immediately uh, after declaring a pandemic, they started talking about an infodemic. And actually, shortly after the, the pandemic was declared, I went into the website of the World Health Organization and I looked into their top five priorities. And I found it as number two, fighting the infodemic. And pay attention, first of all, it's so high in their priorities. Second of all, they already uh, even invented a new term. And uh, um, again, from the beginning of the pandemic, right? This is from February 12, 2020. There's this article in MIT Technology Review talking about this new event infodemic. Um, and uh, if you look into the subtitle, they're talking about panic racism. So you see really kind of focus, not that much on factuality, but on the potential to do harm. And I'm actually glad that people started, you know, paying attention to the, to the second part of the problem. Um, and of course, at the beginning of the pandemic, you wanted to do something like many other researchers, and you wanted to do certain kind of data notation that would be interesting from different perspectives, the perspective of journalists, fact checkers, social media platforms, policymakers in society. And we have developed a schema uh, focused around seven questions and, and, and with different subtypes. I'm not going to go into super much detail, but I can show you, for example, here we have like panic, zombie apocalypse is coming, uh, you know, Americans are panic buying guns and stuff, or, uh, you know, xenophobic stuff like don't eat Chinese food or, or you know, fake cures like freshly pulled garlic water is, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, curing uh, uh, and so on and so forth. and and and, and uh, uh, hoaxes and, and 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 but also kind of some positive things like advice and uh, discussion of action taken. Um, and those are the questions that we have. We have actually a, 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 a system that works on that in in in, in four languages. But actually, we have data in in, in additional languages, it's just not there. So we have an API. So if you give it an article, it is going to tell you how propagandistic it is, or it's going to tell you the span of the, the, the specific propaganda techniques used there, or for an article, it's going to tell whether it's left, center, right biased, or uh, how check work is actually a specific uh, sentence and uh, detection of previously fact check claims and all the things related to COVID-19 in different languages. So all this is exposed as APIs. And actually we do more things. We also do framing, which I didn't really touch much. And of course, this is team's work. This is work done uh, when I was in the Qatar Computing Research Institute uh, and in cooperation with MIT and with uh, plenty of students from the Sofia University. Um, and we have been working uh, with, with uh, Al Jazeera, with MIT. We had a work cooperation with RT Ireland. Um, um, I have been working with Facebook on propaganda detection memes. Uh, United Nations have interest in the language of diplomacy which is somehow related neutral. The leading fact-checking organization in Spain has been contributing data to some of this research and so on and so forth. Um, okay, and I'll finish here with a question. Can you win the war on fake news? Um, so back in 2019, I was invited together with two other experts in the by the Interparliamentary Assembly, where for a couple of hours, uh, members uh, from 180 member states have been asking us, uh, you know, different questions, but basically they are all around one question. What kind of legislation can we possibly pass tomorrow in our parliament to deal with the problem once and for all? And of course, certain kind of legislation has space in many countries, certain kind of hate speech or propaganda of terrorism is illegal or there are rules related to financing of, of political elections and so on and so forth and advertisements. But you really need the cooperation of the social media companies because it's happening in their platforms. And fact checking is very important. And we as researchers are developing different kinds of tools. But again, if you look into the big question, I'm glad to say that I'm positive about this because there's an example. So Finland, uh, uh, back in 2019, has declared that they, have, that they are actually winning uh, the war on fake news. And this is thanks to a massive media literacy campaign. So they start in 2014. And um, in five years of targeting all levels of society, primarily the schools, um, they have actually, you know, uh, uh, made uh, fake news largely irrelevant. And of course, 
Sri Lanka is one of the, the best in, in, in media literacy across Europe. So to finish, uh, right before the pandemic, I was in, invited in India uh, and uh, I found the tomb of uh, Gandhi and I found something very curious. He was saying, okay, don't listen to rumor. If you do, don't believe it. So I think that if we all do that, uh, um, the problem is going to be solved to a large extent because the problem is that, uh, you know, the difference between fake news, for example, and spam is, uh, if you think of spam, spam was a huge problem 15, 20 years ago. It is kind of more or less irrelevant today. Um, um, and uh, the difference, however, is that if I sent a spam to a thousand people, it probably dies there. If I sent some very viral fake news to a thousand people, they are probably going to share it. And if we can block this mechanism by media literacy, by teaching people not to do it, this is going to be uh, a way to make uh, fake news much less viral. And this is kind of their weak point. And finally, to one other point I want to make sure is that uh, there's uh, fake news, but there's also, and these claims, there's also opinions, and there are also different perspectives. And uh, in many cases, there's no absolute truth. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Preslav, for a very nice and inspiring talk and especially conclusion there. Um, we have time for uh, maybe a couple of questions. Um, if folks would either like to raise hand or you can type in chat um, and we'll call them out, read them out, et cetera. Let me kind of uh, ask one to start off. So I guess I'm curious about uh, sort of where you see uh, some of these tools that you've built kind of going. So, um, I mean, basically when you uh, kind of have something like what you showed there uh, for the kind of time B uh, COVID-19 demo, like, do you find that that's a way to like, uh, let's see, what's my question? Do you find that basically like uh, kind of organizations will reach out to you? Do you find that like kind of users themselves are, are using this? Like who, who do you find you're kind of reaching with these sorts of tools? Yeah, so so uh, we have we have interacted with certain organizations. So uh, we have been like working with journalists like Al Jazeera. Uh, we have been working with uh, certain faction organizations uh, uh, like Neutro. We have been uh, working on related things, not exactly propaganda, but the kind of studying the language of diplomacy with, with the United Nations. We have been interacting with uh, Facebook on on uh, uh, um, Detecting propaganda techniques in memes. So, um, um, and, and, but uh, frankly, um, we are also, you need also kind of to realize that we are researchers, right? And we are, uh, uh, we are developing the technology. And, and the kind of work that we do is, I mean, okay, you, you can think of, of two kinds of, even at the research side, right? I mean, you can think of two different uh, communities. So, one is that, uh, that developing the tools, and the other one is the one that applying the tools. So kind of in the artificial intelligence and, and uh, NLP uh, community, uh, the first kind of research is appreciated, right? And I want a system that does better, you know, has higher results and so on and so forth. In social computing conferences, actually kind of what is the actual method is not so interesting. The interesting thing is actually what you find, right? And, and, and one other thing that we have been trying to do is we have been like trying to reach to some social scientists. So for example, this work on the UK elections, we have done with people uh, that, that, that are interested in that kind of research. So, but um, uh, we probably can do more because we have uh, interesting tools and, and, and uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, especially with everything kind of moving so quickly these days, it's like, if you think something didn't work a year ago and, you know, an organization wrote it off, it's probably a different scenario now. So, um, yeah. Let's see, other questions. Any, anyone have a burning question to ask before we close out here? So in the meantime, if there's no question, I can probably like show you, you know, a, a quick demo, right, of something. So see, this is this is Natural News, which is a known fake news website. And I went here and, you know, in this article, analyze.mb.org, and I have put the link and I clicked on analyze and this is what comes back. So his bias, it's uh, extreme, right? It's propaganda score. Okay, he didn't find much. And he's the, the fine grain kind of propaganda techniques. So you see emotional language, uh, you know, and 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 uh, uh, you know, 
the you know the the most epic and destructive stock market crash in history. That's like an exaggeration. So here it's not clear how to do it because you have an overlap of, of techniques. So that's why it looks a little bit weird. Um, um, basically, you can go and you can you can do this yourself, right? And you can if you can go and you can enter any text or, or any link. Okay. So after that, at the end, I have okay. That's kind of a bit long. We have the check wordiness, right? So uh, this is kind of chopped into sentences. And at the bottom, they are not interesting questions. Or so far today, this is exactly what is unfolding. There is nothing interesting here, right? But kind of at the at the beginning of the list uh, are the the more interesting things. Um, so this is the 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 uh, you know a two way you can actually go and you can explore uh, different propaganda techniques. You can see them from the left, from the right, and I think this is like a very nice media literacy tool because it teaches you the techniques. And actually, after you interact with this tool for a while, uh, you know I, I basically cannot unsee it, right? So kind of I see them everywhere. Um, so about COVID nineteen. Um, is the tool and it works in different languages. I can take, uh, you know, a, a random sample, you know, and, and I can, you know, classify the tweet, you know, to see, okay, this is kind of, you know, I can see uh, uh, where it contains verifiable factual claim and kind of those questions that we discussed, where it's of public interest, where it's harmful. Um, and there's a little bit of, of uh, yeah, so you can give it a try. Um, and uh, we have also, so for example, um, if I go to the BBC website, for example, we have, uh, uh, okay, I don't know what I have shared. Maybe I need to share my entire screen uh, to be able, okay, right word? No. How do I share my entire screen? I don't know. Because you are not going to see otherwise the uh, browser maybe advanced. Okay, it, it should be like desktop or something at the top left of the. Yeah, I think. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Nakab. I know but, we're getting close. We're we're just after three o'clock here, so. Well, we'll see. Okay. We'll see what he's got, and then we'll we'll. Yes, close out here. I know we'll need to wrap up soon. Thanks. Okay, so um, so this is just kind of a media profile that we're building, for example, for BBC on the centrality, uh, propagandistic content, framing, uh, factuality of reporting, uh, left center right bias, uh, their audience that they're read by liberal. They're biased with respect to specific topics, and we are doing such profiles for different media. And you can access this from the Tambi uh, web, website site, or you can kind of access it via the browser. The Tambi website is a news aggregator, something for Google News, which actually tells you what you are reading. As I'm reading, I can actually click, uh, and I can get some background information about the media. Awesome. Well, thanks for showing us all those demos. Yeah, it's really, really cool stuff. So. Um... Yeah, thanks everyone uh, for joining us today. Um, Preslav, I sent you a message in the chat. I don't know if you saw that. But, sure. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. So thanks so much. And uh, yeah, I guess we'll have more events in this series uh, coming up. So stay tuned for uh, announcements and such. Thanks a lot, everyone. Thank you all. Have a great day.